Thank you for joining us again Sorry. on Africa Speaks. Tom, let's start with the state of the press, the state of journalism in East Africa and the Horn of Africa in 2015. What are your thoughts? A lot of challenges. Definitely a lot of challenges this year um, for many reasons. I mean, I, I think the two, two big problems that the press are facing are numerous elections yep. all over East Africa, and, uh, including the Horn, and numerous cases of insecurity, uh, whether it's from sort of terrorist-related insecurity or internal security. And, and you know, generally speaking, I, I'm finding that in the past, when the press was seen as an ally to authorities, we're more and more viewed as the enemy and targeted as such. By who? By the, by the governments in these states or by everybody generally or by the, the, the terrorists that have been targeting people across uh, the Horn and, and parts of East Africa? Well, that's a depressing thing. Everyone you just mentioned <laughs> are perpetrators. I mean, you know, we have the, the situation of terrorism in, in Somalia where Al-Shabaab are routinely targeting uh, the press there. But so are also authorities. I mean, yeah. We had five arrests just the beginning of this year alone in Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a collection of individuals, but it also can be the public. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and that's sort of why we have to be uh, more alert than, than possibly last year mm -hmm. in protecting the press. Let's nuance this uh, a bit further and talk about section by section of the people who are targeting uh, members of the press. Let's start with governments, obviously. The, they are supposed to be perhaps the bastions of um, moral and legal authority as regards the protection of citizens, including journalists. But in Sudan, journalists being killed there. What do you make of the government's own interaction with journalists across East Africa? Yeah, I mean, they're the main perpetrators, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I am getting the impression that uh, a lot of individuals within government categorize journalists or, or even media houses as being either the opposition or following one political party mm -hmm. and therefore they target them at every turn. I mean, uh, and you know what I also I'm seeing more of is instead of targeting the problem, they target the messenger. Mm -hmm. Let's look at like a small country like Burundi, which also has elections this year. A good friend of mine is now in jail. His name is uh, Bob Rugarika. And he, he runs something called RPA, Radio Public Africa. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, shed some new light on this, this terrible murder case that happened last year of three nuns. Uh, and because of exposing that, what do they do? They throw him in jail, as opposed to looking at his investigations and working with him. And trying to, to see whether the they'd be able yeah. to get to the truth yeah. of the matter. Yeah. How about in Sudan? Salva Kiir is a person who, um, perhaps because it's such a new nation, might be new to the interactions that he should be having with members of the fourth estate in that country. And yet, he's taken a very, very negative um, yeah. tone with, with members of the press. What, what is the state there? What is the status in South Sudan? Honestly, I've not seen it this bad uh, since independence. And I, you know, I've, South Sudan is very close to my heart. I used to live there uh, and report there. Um, it's. And again, it goes along with the trend that we're seeing, not just in Africa, but across the world, where yeah. when governments feel at threat in power, they target the press. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think there's anyone in East Africa more at threat of losing his seat than Salva Kiir at this stage, you know, mm -hmm. because of the, the conflict, the internal conflict. And um, it, it's showing, and it, it's interesting, it, it, it shows on all levels of press. I mean, you know, like the, um, to give an example, the the internet penetration of South Sudan is, is not nearly as high as other parts of East Africa or Kenya. Yeah. Uh, but they still single out the press. I mean, there's a, there's a website, a very popular news website called Sudan Tribune. Mm -hmm. uh, and just two days ago in a, in a, a, a big press conference, uh, Salva Kiir accused them of being sort of tools of the opposition. And uh, it's got to the point in, in South Sudan where reporters are basically afraid to, to report on the conflict. Yeah. And you have to report on the conflict. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that's of, of national concern. True. Um, although uh, the, the opposition in this case, uh, uh, SPLM um, uh, headed by, by Riyak Mashar, mm. is doing a pretty good job in terms of publicizing its point of view with regard to the conflict. And as they say, I mean, w um, the, casual, the first casualty um, in any war is the truth. Yeah. How... how how difficult is it to operate in an environment where the opposition is also spinning its own very 
very bombastic at times narrative of what's going on in South Sudan. And here is Salva Kiir and the government of South Sudan trying to shut down um, institutions like the, the Sudan Tribune. Right, right. Well, fair enough. I mean, it, I, you know, and, and perhaps the response from Salva Kiir and his government is reactionary towards that. Yeah. I mean, you can say many things about Riek Mashar, but he's, one thing is he's very savvy with the media mm. and the press. And you hit a nail on the head and he knows how to twist the narrative. Yeah. Um, but instead of closing down all uh, websites and newspapers and radio stations, which South Sudan seems to be on course to do, you need to work with the press. Yeah. You know, this is the, the, the key. You know, instead of uh, enacting new laws to make sure that no one can report further on a topic, make sure you, you collaborate with them. That's true. One more thing before we move on to um, other countries within the Horn and, and uh, East Africa on South Sudan. The African Union Heads of State's Assembly has just taken place. Not much coming out on the reports that were supposed to have been done by the African Union as regards the situation in South Sudan. But aside from their own responsibility to do that, do you think the press is doing enough to get the information that it needs out of the African Union with respect to that? That's an interesting question. Uh, possibly not. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, to, to give you an example, uh, there was one station in South Sudan called I Radio, and they interviewed the rebel spokesman at the African Union summit. Uh, and immediately when that happened, uh, actually it was a rebel spokesman and another individual in the opposition. And because of that, uh, the station was almost closed back in, in Juba, the capital of South Sudan. So, I, I mean, my fear is that the, at least the South Sudanese press is playing a very careful balancing act, yeah. even when they're uh, at present in, in the African Union, mm -hmm. uh, which means it, it's beholden to the international press yeah. to cover and, and report these topics. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the problem there, of course, is that the international press only has so much attention span. It's usually very limited. Yeah, uh, in these matters, so that we're not but really getting to the depths of things. But how about East African press? Um, we're often accused of being very insular. Yeah, but this is yeah. a this is a conflict that could affect us all um, in one respect or another. I mean, the the Lapset project really is is pinned in in many ways on the stability of South Sudan. Absolutely. Why do you Why do you think there's no reporting on this issue? I think you, you already said it. I mean, a, a lot of the East African countries are too insular with their reporting, and they focus too much on personalities and the politics. You know, I mean, I can predict what the headlines will be tomorrow for yeah. the Kenyan press. It's, you know, <laughs> Raila says or Uhuru says. Yeah. And they don't, they don't, it, there seems to be a, a gap in terms of seeing the, the big picture, like the Labset project, for example, sure. and how it can affect Kenya's economy. I think that's something that just needs to be worked on in, in, in a lot of the East African countries to, to get a more regional perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, newspapers like the East African are so important, I think. You know? True. And yeah. we'll get to that in a moment. Let's yeah. just lead you into a break right now. We're about to take a short break, but you can contribute to this discussion on the role of the press and freedom of the press in East Africa and the Horn of Africa region. The hashtag is KTN Africa Speaks, as well as the Twitter handle for this show is at KTN Africa Speaks, or you could tweet me directly on at John Allen Amu. Get into this discussion and let's hear what, the, what your perspectives are on the role of the press, but more, more than the role of the press, the state of the press in terms of freedom and attacks on the press in East Africa. Back in a moment. Welcome back to Africa Speaks. This week we're talking about the, the state of the media in East Africa and the Horn of Africa region. Here to discuss this with me is Tom Rhodes uh, from uh, the CPJ, but you can discuss this as well with us. Send us your perspectives on hashtag KT and Africa Speaks or, at, or you can tweet me on at John Allen Namu or tweet the program's handle at KTN Africa Speaks. And before the break, Tom, we we're just about to get into the problems that the East African is facing right now in Tanzania. What do you make of the situation there? You see, Tanzania, for a lot of Kenyans and, a lot, and quite a number of East Africans, is, is very difficult to understand, especially in terms of the media environment, because yeah. not a lot comes out uh, about it. But when they decided to, to, to uh, shut 
the East Africa. Now, that seemed for a lot of people like a very surprising move. But is it as surprising, uh, or should we be as surprised as m many of us were? Yeah, I, I don't think we should be. Um, you know, Tanzania is very insular, in, as you said, in terms of its press and also its politics. Yeah. And something that a lot of people don't seem to realize is that, I'm not sure why, Tanzania always seems to get a very good report card, mm -hmm. you know, by both regional and international standards. And I'm, I'm always questioning that because they have around 17 laws which are basically against the press. Yeah. You know, I mean, in, in, to give you an example, in Tanzania, if they want to shut down a newspaper, they can. They just make an order and it's done. And this is what they've done with, with the East Africa. East Africa, you ostensibly know. because it uh, hadn't filed for proper licenses, but we know a lot of that came out of uh, Gado's cartoon that depicted. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was mostly. In, in yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was Gado's cartoon and maybe the reporting that the, the, the East African had done in terms of, of the EA, you know, its, its reluctance to join the East Af Af African community um, and the rebel movements in Rwanda, mm -hmm. these, these three issues. But um, yeah, I mean, the fact that they can summarily stop it just like that is, is very frightening, yeah. um, especially because this is an election year, general elections for Tanzania. And I think the message that they want to convey is, you know, look, East African, you have to toe the line but even more so, you can imagine if you're a local newspaper in Dar es Salaam and the East African is closed, what are you going to do? What, you're going to censor yourselves yeah. you know, um, ahead of October elections. True, interesting point that you raise about the elections. It's not just an election, there. it's, it's also a transition uh, yeah. as, as well. And the, the, the kind of reporting that we'd expect coming out of Tanzania with respect to candidates, with respect to scandals around uh, uh, perhaps electioneering uh, uh, practices there, we don't see. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, another interesting thing that you talked about there was, was the laws that uh, would be used to forbid journalists from doing their jobs. Is this something that we're seeing being up, uh, cross applied in, in East Africa, in the Horn of African region? Sure, sure. One thing I've noticed is that you know, East African countries generally have very good constitutions defending press freedom, yeah. Kenya included, South Sudan even. Uh, but there are always laws to counter that. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we can see this in, in Kenya, of course, with the media law passed in 2013 and now with the security law. And I also find that authorities, not just in Kenya, but around the world, tend to use the law when they need it to censor the press and they ignore the, the laws uh, that actually defend the press. Um, I mean, look, we, we have nine countries in Africa with access to information laws, for example, and they're some of the worst countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, I mean, Uganda somehow, you know, Angola. Yeah. These are not countries that, that actually uh, allow their journalists access to, to public officials, uh, and yet these laws are on the books. And interestingly, um, mm -hmm. they'd be in the books as insofar as being in the Constitution, but um, a subsidiary law that, that would operationalize that overarching law doesn't exist in, in some of these countries. Well, as I say, we only have nine mm -hmm. in all of the, the African continent, you know, so I, I think that's something that journalists need to push for and realize it's their right, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it, there's public official. It's almost impossible. But the guy in the opposition is always available <laughs> for yeah. the story, you know. So, <laughs> so you end up looking very biased because yeah. he's the guy who picks up his phone. That's and, true. And not the information minister. Very practical you know? issues and especially yeah. with regard to um, terrorism and insecurity, something that's being faced not just here in the Horn of Africa region and East Africa, mm -hmm. but way over in West Africa that coincidentally they're also having an election um, this year. Um, what do you think the impact is, though, of the security challenges that East Africa and the Horn of African region are facing on the clamping down on freedom of the press, especially to report on those issues? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, look, it's, it's sensitive times, and um, governments have a right to be wary of, of what information is leaked. That's, that's understandable. Um, but I fear that it's often used as a preface to, to clamp down on the press as opposed to to actually genuinely uh, show concern over security issues, you know. I mean, uh, this security law has, has got me very worried here in Kenya, for yeah. example. I mean, it, it basically stops any investigative reporting on security operations, however flawed they may be. 
Um, you, you know this firsthand, of course. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's worrying, you know, because it, these same laws can be used to, to sort of censor on a wider scale. Mm -hmm. I, I also find it, you know, if, if you look at the security law of Kenya, the media law of Kenya, but also the laws of, of as we said, Tanzania, um, and rumors of a similar law in Uganda. And, and exactly, rumors of a similar law in Uganda, uh, Ethiopia. All of them, it's it's up to the authorities, at the behest of the authorities, to interpret what is insightful. You know, what is uh, you know sort of considered vulgar, yeah. etc. Without any kind of right to reply or clause of of say sort of you know uh, benefit to the public. True. Uh, within these these kind of legislation, but y to to play devil ad devil's advocate for a moment, yeah. uh, imagine the position that a government sits in, um, where um, terrorists are constantly using media as a tool to propagate their message, or are media savvy enough to be able to get their messaging into mainstream media with no adequate response from them, perhaps, yes, it might be their fault that they don't have a counter-narrative to put out there, to push out there, but at the same time, their enemies are using the same platforms that they should be using and using them very effectively. Is that, um, is that uh, something that you can count against the media in terms of its use, in, in terms of the use of its role, um, especially in reporting about terrorism? I guess, although I, I don't know if it's there really. I, I don't see journalists taking the side of Al-Shabaab or, or reporting from that perspective. I see, I mean, uh, uh, for example, the Al-Shabaab movement in Somalia is very media savvy in yeah. terms of Twitter feeds and social media. But I don't see the local press of Somalia adhering to their, to their narratives so much. Mm -hmm. you know, I, so in a sense, instead of just trying to silence everyone, uh, again, I always go back to this point that there needs to be more engagement. By authorities, but yeah, I mean, it's, it is of course a, a genuine concern. Yeah, you know? especially yeah. when it comes to the messaging that they they're able to get out there. It might not necessarily be their own narrative that's being put out there, but say, for instance, an attack happens in Mogadishu, and there's no reporting from Amisom or the the mainstream press or the government with respect to what happens. Al Shabab comes out with evidence, purported evidence. Right. Right. Of, of what exactly happened there. As a journalist, you're, you're really put in a, in, a, in a very interesting situation where you have this evidence or this purported evidence, and yet it comes from the very source that you're not supposed to quote um, as liberally as you would um, other sources. Yeah, yeah. And that leads to disinformation and to rumors. You know, I mean, one example, I, I mean, I, I keep switching back to South Sudan, but, you know, reporters were afraid to... Uh, report on rebel offenses yeah. in the region uh, and then of course we're left with rumors and there was a dangerous rumor that in, in one town in Jonglei State in True. Bor that the rebels were supposed to be attacking so everyone fled the town left their homes left their land lost everything based on a rumor you know and, mm -hmm. and I always try and use these kind of examples to show that you know you need to have access to information and, and to be, get both sides yeah uh, to inform the of, the, of the story. Let me just get some feedback in here. Uh, Miss J says, uh, wow, Tanzania would be the last country to mention in terms of limited press freedom. 17 laws, that's a lot. It, it is quite a I lot when you think about it. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean. uh, Maggie Addis says, uh, media freedom in East Africa is still far away to be achieved. And Paul Latiwa says, it'll take time before African governments get to know the importance of press freedom. They see media as a threat to them. But thank you very much for your comments as well as your, your, your following this program. Very interesting and important discussion for us. Let's wind it up, uh, Tom, with what you forecast um, for 2015 going forward in terms of um, the, the, the state of the media in East Africa and the Horn of Africa region. That's a tough one, I see you. <laughs> um, well, tough, but not too tough. I think, all right, fair enough. <laughs> I, I think it's positive and negative. Yeah. Let me start with positive for once. I mean, we had a, a wonderful landmark victory in Burkina Faso where the African courts uh, ruled that criminal defamation does not comply with international and regional standards and, and African standards mm -hmm. of, of uh, right to information and press freedom. This is what I'm hoping is that we're going to see more and more press groups fighting back to, to take back these legislative attacks 
and, and ensure that things like criminal defamation are a thing of the past. Yeah. I think that'll do a lot for, for the press in, across the continent. Do you hope the so same could happen in a country, say, like Ethiopia? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you. But yeah. maybe the, the, the impetus will be there. I mean, look, Ethiopia is the, the homeland of African Union, so they may have to listen eventually. True. You know? So that's something positive that I can see. Um, on the negative side, I'm, I'm afraid. We have elections in Tanzania, Ethiopia, Burundi, um, South Sudan, mm -hmm. Nigeria, Congo, DRC. Uh, you name it. They're mm -hmm. all over the country. And the following year, there'll and be the following Uganda, year, there's going to be Rwanda. Uganda and then Rwanda. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure for the press this year and in the upcoming years. Yeah. Um, and I predict a lot more sort of targeting of online media mm -hmm. as more and more journalists are using internet and social media to convey their views. True. Let, let's actually wind up there. We've seen very interesting times in Kenya with, re, with respect to online media and, and, and the freedom to be able to express certain views online. Um, what do you think is the problem there? Is there a problem that, that, uh, that is being faced in East Africa or is it, you know, really just um, a majority of voices speaking out against people who are lone rangers in terms of their opinions. You, you mean like social media, this social kind of media, thing? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it is a, a big issue. Um, and there's problems on both sides, right? I mean, there's a lot of irresponsible Twitter feeds and social media, uh, particularly when there's events here in Kenya, like the yeah. elections, for example, or the ICC trials. It's terrible looking at what kind of comments people are, are spreading all over mm -hmm. the internet. Um, but then I also fear the other side too. Uh, going back to Tanzania, for example, when there's, a, there's many of these online uh, platforms where people can view their, their uh, grievances and so on, and they get flooded by suspected government personalities to, to close down these, these discussions. Mm -hmm. I'm also worried about Kenya and the way they're reacting to what they call hate speech. I mean, it seems very one-sided. You know, why is it only the public seems to be prosecuted for hate speech and not the politicians? Yeah. Whereas we have many cases of, of, of MPs, etc., mm -hmm. uh, you know, being very irresponsible on social media. And, okay, and another case in point is in terms of targeting online whistleblowers. Um, Abraham Mutai yeah. very recently was, uh, was picked up in, in, uh, in uh, Mombasa huge media a uh, huge social media campaign to get him out but that doesn't negate the fact that he was picked up in the first place for um, you know unraveling quite a f number of um, facts about what was happening in Isiolo and different parts of the country and of course there was that Embu case um, is the state of uh, whistleblowers I should ask online and generally um, is it under threat it could be you know, and, and, and I'm glad you raised that case of the Embu. I mean, it was, she was a university student, and the comments she made on social media were just simply critical of the governor. She found herself in jail for four days, yeah. you know, and had to plead for forgiveness to be released. When you have those kind of examples mounting and mounting, who's going to speak out anymore? And, th and that is worrying, definitely worrying. Yeah. Tom Rhodes, thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon on uh, Africa Speaks. Not very hopeful uh, <laughs> in terms of our forecast is. <laughs> yeah but uh, it is what it is and um, hopefully I mean something can happen um, in Kenya and in East Africa and the Horn of Africa region to be able to change what seems to be a very very uh, quick slide down the path of uh, media intolerance um, in these countries but nonetheless thanks a lot and thanks for the work that you're doing keep us informed if uh, if uh, any more journalists are being threatened in Kenya and in uh, in the Horn of Africa region where, sure. where you work sure yeah well that's where we're about to end it on Africa speaks this afternoon thank you very much for joining us thank you very much for sending us your feedback but we'll wind up as always with a nice little song um, from Africa from the continent Something that's been uh, getting quite a bit of airplay online and um, on the airwaves is from Tanzania, coincidentally, the land with 17 media laws. <laughs> this one by Ali Kiba, the title of the track is Moana. I'm John Alanamu. Have a good afternoon.